so welcome to today's uh, webinar and uh, the title of the webinar today is Speech Analytics and the Contact Center. Speech Analytics is a, a fascinating technology, one I've been behind for the past 10 years and it's great to see that it's gone from a sort of um, almost a theoretical concept into really quite something quite mainstream. So uh, I think it's absolutely fabulous to uh, see that. Um, it's an area that uh, our first of our speakers, Martin Hill Wilson, has uh, spoken on, and I've been to uh, some workshops that uh, Martin has conducted oh, that nice. before in the in the past. So, yeah. uh, uh, Martin, welcome. Thank you very much. Welcome. For people not familiar with uh, Brain Food Consulting, do you want to give this short pen uh, profile of what you do? Right. So, seven years ago, I set my own business up. I take most of the time now um, doing keynotes, uh, doing webinars, writing white papers. Um, I've got old enough to chair conferences now, <laughs> as well, um, and it's pretty much on all the topics. So the things that are hot in my domain are omnichannel, that's a big thing, yep. um, mobile is coming up, Pro, um, proactive is coming up, interestingly, uh, big changes there, and uh, intelligence assistance, or AI, depending on which way you want to look at it. All those things are bubbling up. Um, and my impression of, of where the market's at now is there's much more momentum in customer service. You know, I mean, we've done it for a long time, and there's been periods where nothing has changed. You know, for long periods, nothing's changed. Everybody's now reinventing. I think it's an exciting time to be around. And also delighted to uh, welcome on our webinar today, uh, Arthur Mikelczyk, uh, who is the Chief Technology Officer for New Voice Media. Uh, how long have you been with New Voice Media now? I'm relatively new to New Voice Media. I've been here uh, for six months. So, and already get, getting together with uh, to the technical yes, teams yes, here. Uh, yes, it's a very exciting uh, space, uh, which, because of the moment that you mentioned, I found uh, much more interesting than, than what I've been doing before. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's really good to be again in a, in a space that's been reinvented and is undergoing a huge transformation. Yeah. Well, we'll be asking you a lot of uh, technical details on some of the, uh, the ways that some of this technology uh, works together. I think it would be very interesting. Uh, very interesting to see it overall. Just a reminder, if uh, you want to watch a replay of today's webinar, you can do that callcenterhelper.com forward slash uh, recorded uh, webinars. If you're not already logged in, if you'd like to log into our chat room, the link here is callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat. Uh, and uh, one of the added advantage is that you can uh, Download slides from the uh, from the link here, so uh, which would be uh, which would be good. And um, while you're in the chat room, uh, we do have an added incentive. There is a bottle of champagne or a box of uh, chocolates for the best tip. So if you'd like to type hashtag tip for a tip or hashtag question for a question, and uh, you should be able to uh, uh, participate there. So the first question I'd like to ask when you're logged into the chat room is how do you currently find poor quality calls? So we've got a range of uh, different uh, approaches coming through. Uh, uh, the most common one looking at the results seems to be a combination of either disposition codes, these are the codes at the end of uh, like call reason codes within your CRM or customer database, uh, as does actually reacting to customer complaints. Um, we've got, uh, Chanel said, uh, random call audits and customer complaints. Uh, Mike, who's in Chesapeake, uh, Virginia, says uh, quality evaluations, customer complaints, as well as speech analytics to find forward calls. Uh, also says our supervisors focus on the random sample evaluations and the quality department focuses evaluations on low performance. That's quite an interesting yep. uh, breakdown. Uh, Mike says, we also use customer satisfaction surveys to define uh, poor quality calls. Uh, and uh, uh, Oliver says, random uh, random or complaints. Uh, and Danny says, we see this through ticket escalations, presumably coming off the uh, yeah, off help desk system. So that's quite, uh, quite, uh, quite fascinating overall. Right, we're going to ask a poll question now. And uh, the poll question is, what percentage of calls are at a lower quality than you would like. So is it, uh, and this is not called, this is contact uh, within your system. What percentage of your customer contacts are lower quality than you, you would like? 
Uh, 0 to 1 percent, 2 to 4 percent, 5 to 9 percent, 10 to 24 percent, or 25 percent or more. Arta, have you got any feeling of what which uh, value you think is likely to come out? Yeah, I, yeah, I think it's around the 10 percent. 10 percent. Well, let's have a look at the. Uh, I think we've nearly got all of the uh, all of the votes coming through here. Let's just close the uh, results and pop those up on the screen. Sample size of 74. Um, so we have 3% uh, have got almost nothing in terms of uh, uh, the number of low quality. 9% uh, come in the 2 to 4 range, but the most uh, uh, typical one there is indeed the 10 to 25% range there, accounting for about 37% of the audience. And rather worryingly here, um, for 17% of the audience, over a quarter of their contacts are lower quality than they'd. That's because our audience today has got very high standards. <laughs> well, there could also be an element of self-selecting that the people <laughs> who uh, are uh, coming today are looking for, are looking at speech analytics as a way of doing it. I tell you what, though, isn't it? whatever quality means, and that's a whole new conversation, but it is very difficult to be consistent in our space. And I think that that's often, you know, quality and consistency is the toughest thing. And, and if you look at Omnichannel today, for example, you know, there's lots of evidence that you can do it well on the phone, but you don't do it well on the email. There's many, many reasons why quality doesn't measure up these days. Indeed. Well, that, now's probably quite a good time to um, pass the baton across to uh, Martin. And uh, Martin, if you'd like to uh, take us through some of your thoughts on uh, how speech analytics can be used in the contact. Be delighted. Have you passed me over? I have passed the baton across to you. Oh, I haven't hidden the poll. Oh, let's... Uh... I don't know if that's coming through to you. Uh, in a minute, have I got the option to share the screen? Let's just uh, reset that. Wait in a second. Can you see me? Not currently. Could you, uh, Rachel, could you just do the quick uh, flick across to Martin? There we go, there we go, we're ready to go. Flips. Fantastic, so let's just move that bit out and get here. Should now be into full screen mode. There we Is that are. good? Excellent. Right, hello everyone, let's get going. Um, talking about speech analytics uh, in, the, in the call center. Um, I'd like to start talking about the importance of it because um, I don't know what the final numbers are, um, I've got a feel that we've got about 15% of us in the contact center industry, in the UK anyway, using analytics. John C., I think, gave me a figure of 20% recently, but it's still way under what it should be. Um, and so a lot of us are still in the process of trying to communicate to our executive class why this stuff matters. So I thought I'd put a section in here to give you some more food for thought about how you position it and how you explain value. I think the biggest, simplest idea that will probably resonate with most people uh, at the moment is that in a world of customer experience and in a world that has got words like disruption, agile, and goodness knows what in the middle of it, <laughs> it's just hard to keep up to speed with where customers are going these days. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result of that, the contact center is one of the places, one of the most important places where you can keep pace if you can see what the heck's going on. And because we need to do that, we need to use every single opportunity we can uh, to keep up to space, uh, pace with customers. Now, that being said, I think it's also fair to say that we're not necessarily setting the pace in the contact center with regard to service innovation. So if I think about what's exciting, what's happened, you know, we're almost stuck in a time warp. We did it 20 years ago. E-commerce kind of turned up. You know, mobiles turned up. Apps are turning up. There's a lot of buzz at the moment about delivering service, for example, on a messaging platform with a bot or something like that. But we haven't recaptured the high ground at all in terms of customer service or call centers in particular being a place where things are happening. Um, and it stands to reason if customers are changing, we need to be moving the business on. So our focus on service design, there's innovation levels, you know, making sure that we know it's easy to engage. That's a huge thing on mobile, for example, and online. We haven't duplicated that same kind of intent. So 
I would argue that we're behind the curve, and we're behind the curve because we really don't have an effective feedback loop, which often you do on I. I mean, we don't have the equivalent, for example, of being able to see the IP traffic and the movement, which people online do. You know, mm -hmm. we're blind in that sense. We don't get a footprint in the same way in the contact center. So we need a way to discover what matters from the customer's point of view, the outside perspective. And as a result of that, if there's stuff to fix, what needs fixing? And we need to have that uh, insight and continuous, continuous improvement loop built into contact centers. And this then sits at a broader perspective, which is the, you know, the, the question to ask yourself in the mirror as a team, which is, do we just want to work smarter or do we just want to work harder? You know, and most people, unfortunately, <laughs> are still just working harder. What we need to do is to focus upon getting smarter in terms of what we do in call centers. Hence, we need feedback. Hence, we need the ability to action it. Now, for me, uh, speech analytics, text analytics, um, all forms of analytics, in other words, understanding what the customer is talking about, resolves the problem of knowing what's going on. And one of the areas that we can see that we don't really know what's going on is in the way we classify uh, outcomes in the call center, which relies upon the advisor community. That's fine. By the way, you sh should get spooked if you have an attrition greater than 10% because you have a very inconsistent way of doing that. But the clue to the problem is the fact everybody has got at least 10, 15, 20% called other. And in fact, could we have that put in the chat room as maybe people talking about what percentage of other they have in their own call dispositions? Because my point is that's far too high because it doesn't fit into anything else. What's going on in that area at the end of the day? So we're flying blind. We don't really have a very good view of what's going on. So the, the question for everyone in the chat room is what percentage of uh, contacts in your CRM system do you put down as other? Because it's just too hard. And one of my first revelations, interestingly, on, on speech analytics is that there is no such thing as a single way of classifying one interaction. You know, we, we spoke about a number of things with you, you know. Now, have you got the ability to have that three-dimensional analysis of what's going on? That's one of the first benefits you get out of speech analytics, which is knowing what is going on. <laughs> Just literally that top level of classification. The other thing I'd say is that lousy wallboard that you've got up on the wall, it's so dull. You know, uh, and it's so uninformative from the customer's perspective. It's all about productivity. It's all about what we're chasing, that, you know, the cues. What it doesn't tell us at all is the experience that we're exchanging, the experience we're creating, and how the customers feel about us as a result. We just do not know as a result of that. So most MI, we have to admit, is absolutely blind to this new goal called customer experience. So Tom says that they put a, around 15% of... Uh, uh -huh. Uh, Thank you, Tom. Things in their system, uh, Tom, uh, in the system as uh, others. Uh, we've just got Ollie and uh, Danny are typing, typing their results okay. currently. Let me know when they've, they've finished that. That's interesting. Good. 15% is the, is the thing. So this slide here, again, uh, you know, if, if, if you are putting your case forward, we will give you the slides on this. I found this one. I like this picture. It's the iceberg, of course, but it's a human. So it's representative <laughs> of, your, of your customer. And there's two points to be made here. Um, tapping into the idea that your organization is probably overexcited about big data. Um, and the point that we should be making customer service is, hey, if you're looking for it, guess where some is? There's a huge reservoir of big data if we can tap into those interactions. So that's the first point. See if some of your data scientists and some of your CX people can be excited about that because they probably haven't thought about it. And then the second thing is, as with all icebergs, you know, it's what's interesting is what we can't see. So in a world where we need to track customers and understand their behavior and respond to it in a much more effective way, there's a big gap between what we know and what we need to learn. And that opportunity is sitting if we can prize open those conversations and understand context, intent, topics, reaction, the whole thing that sits there. So that's the most important way of summarizing what we're missing here it's not just about answering the call, it's learning and in the process of engaging. And uh, some of the feedback from uh, uh, Ollie says it's around 5%. It says the teams are instructed to capture the main reason for the call. Although this may mean we miss some of the lower level detail, 
that would normally be other elements of the choir in choir. So this is always the problem where you, you yeah. might have multiple reasons, but you can only perhaps put one down. So you get a bit too global in yeah. the classification. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's also an interesting debate going on about how many how many codes you you can have. I think the record I saw was 200 in one organization. And really? uh, yeah, there seems to be a sort of a Goldilocks uh, number of sort of between five and uh, uh, five and sixteen, which seems to be where people can remember it in their head. And uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I bet the other interesting question is, I bet you if you were to ask advisors, they would say we could have classified that call in a number of ways. You know, you just get into a habit of that. So the other thing we don't know in life is, are we being consistent in terms of what we hear and how we classify? But uh, you know, anyway, let's, uh, let's hit our first poll, shall so we? So in terms of speech analytics, where you, are you on the journey? Uh, do you have speech analytics or an expert user? Do you have speech analytics and you just come into uh, coming to terms with it? Uh, do you intend to deploy it in the next 12 months uh, or will you not be uh, uh, planning speech analytics? analytics at all. So if you'd like to uh, vote on that, it'd be fascinating. Right, let's have a guess. So if we add the first two together, uh, so what do you think? What's the installed base, do you think? Expert user getting the business answer because you uh, said it already. No, no, no. Well, no, that's my guess, but it's no better than anything else. No, but I, I think it's going to be less than 20%. 20%, yeah. Less than 20 yeah. Yeah. Well, my last uh, research we did showed 20%. Let's see if uh, our research is close. That was about six months ago. And we have 7 plus 14, which is 21%. Ooh. So, uh, massive result. <laughs> Looks like it's uh, going on more. Um, what's very fascinating, 56% of people ah, in the audience are intending to deploy in the next 12 months. And oh, it looks like after in 12 months' time, only about a quarter yeah. of the audience probably won't have speech analytics. Well, if we do a good job, we might even lose that number. By the end. Indeed. So that's quite uh, that's interesting. Quite, quite fascinating on the on those levels there. So, uh, I thought the other thing to be said, because I was scene setting then, who pays for it? That's another interesting thing. I mean, we're not the richest function in in, in an organisation. And there could well be an argument that maybe it's funded out of marketing. Mm. You know. Well, I'm certainly seeing a lot of organizations that it goes into the contact center and it takes them a while to convince marketing of the benefits, but it almost ends up with them marketing, putting in Can't get enough. all the time. Yeah. Can't get enough. No, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Okay, so uh, thank you for that, everybody. Um, there's a little bit of scene setting. Now I want to sort of move on to the next level of detail and really get into the guts of, well, how where does analytics add value? Um, you can describe this in a number of ways, and in, in many respects, they all interrelate. I suppose, essentially, you're either looking at uh, impacting advisors or impacting customers. Uh, you can describe that in a number of ways. I've talked about it in terms of quality management, uh, customer journeys, internal collaboration, um, building customer value. I mean, that's incredibly important, particularly if you're an outbound or sales-oriented organization helping you understand that, and developing the competency and productivity of uh, the folk in the business. So let's talk about one of the classic areas to begin with, performance and quality, uh, and you know some of the things that that can do. Folks who are um, under some sort of external regulation, and I think when I've done some research, it's about 75% of us in the UK uh, are having to fit into this in one form or the other, it means that we do have to say those statements to those customers in the process of selling and, and whatever. And of course, one of the real troubles about that process is that it's manual, it's hard work. I have put here 0.25%. If anybody manages to sample more, love to hear it. Um, but I guess it's never going to be very large. This is based on asking that question many times over. And I am no scientist and no mathematician, but I do know instinctively that that's a very low number upon which to be able to say with confidence mm. we're doing something well. Um, one of the things I've seen in life which works, and it's not difficult, is to say if we ask the question in the same way each time, can we not get a machine to listen out for that and to tell us are people doing that you know, in the way that they should be? And you've got two benefits from that. Number one, um, you're not wasting human beings doing that work. And secondly, if you're listening to uh, you know, 50%, 100%, 80%, you're much more sure of the fact that you're doing that well. Um, and again, some of the analysis I've seen, it's interesting. You can be compliant in some of those questions, but not in all of them. 
In fact, the example I remember, it was the very last question in the sequence that everybody was forgetting to say at the end of the game. Mm. And that dragged down the overall compliance, but everything else was done well. Uh, and again, it's one of those areas where the gap between what the business thinks they're doing and actually what is happening is the interesting point. So I would, I would commend that, and you can't help but feel people like the FCA would, would be absolutely delighted you know, if you were doing a good job on that score. So that's one. Um, another one, uh, and I've managed to get hold of some recent examples, uh, which I think, uh, again, illustrate some of the benefits that you can get. This one happens to be, it's a subsidiary of um, Dodge Telecom. And interestingly, they did some analysis and asked the exam question, who is impacting the customer experience in a ne negative kind of a way um, as a result of presumably their skills, you know, the soft skill stuff. And so rather than doing what a lot of us will do is to say the experience is rubbish, let's put everybody through a retraining process. They decided to use that insight and just focus it on those 20% of people who were not doing very well. And as a result of that, they didn't just deliver them a generic retrain, but they managed to do a customized approach to those 20 people who needed that support. And guess what? They got a much better result uh, coming from that. So in other words, analytics helps you to understand the detail of an individual behavior and to respond uh, effectively as a result of that. And that's a very important point because many people who do coaching find that once you've got people up to a certain standard, it's difficult to take them beyond that general standard. Uh, and how do you understand the detail of that? You know, you get into the Olympics conversation with Brailsford. He's all about making micro mm. improvements, isn't he? And he says, once you get people up to a certain standard, then it gets to be important to really understand the little bits uh, of detail. And again, analytics is capable of helping you in that respect. Here's another interesting one, which is just a lovely example of the difference between an inside out and an outside in perspective. Verizon, uh, well known, particularly in the States. Uh, from an internal perspective, they valued knowledge and being a knowledgeable advisor as one that really knew everything about the products. You know, it was a technically based understanding of knowledgeability. When they then listened to the customers talking about it, the customers interpreted that, not surprisingly, from their perspective of saying, no, a knowledgeable person is a patient one, and somebody, by the way, who's willing to explain it in a number of ways. That's what knowledgeable means. You're not just stuck to a script, but you have a deeper insight into it, and you can talk about it in a way that I can resonate to. And by the way, you're a little bit more gentle with me. You might say it one more time over and not get up, uh, impatient with me. So understanding that, they then looked at the training program and went, that doesn't fit. Let's focus more on soft skills, such as listening, rather than focusing just on the technical aspects of that. And again, that comes through from being able to do that kind of analysis. So I thought that was a great example about how you get benefit. The other area, which I'm a big, big fan of, and we were actually talking about this earlier on, weren't we, Arthur, which is the, the idea of being able to produce uh, dashboards that real time, very close to real time, are reflective of what's actually just been taking place, you know, and that loop. Um, and I don't see that yet in a lot of places, but you can't help but imagine in the future for each advisor to have a feedback on what they have been doing with the customers. And this is where, for instance, one of our core beliefs in New Voice Media is that uh, the data that's in call center and uh, CRM is extremely important to be able to combine these two sources of data where you, where you start getting more uh, visibility in the customer journey. So then mm -hmm. you can see when the cases were closed, how successful they were closed, yes. how quickly a case gets closed after a call has happened. Yeah. And then uh, yeah, it would be nice also if you could extend this in front of the journey before the user starts calling. So there are also solutions that help you track the, and attribute the mm -hmm. web journey the yeah. call, and then you follow through in how the case is resulting in your CRM platform. So, that's really so cool. exciting uh, things are happening. Uh, so joining up the whole yeah. customer yeah. journey. Yeah, yeah. 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 But the, the, the core idea then, of course, making that then visible in real time to exactly. advisors, team leaders, you know, suddenly we're able to understand the impact and therefore mm -hmm. modify behavior. And, uh, and you know, let's, let's give ourselves the, the, the luxury of pretending that's already happened. It will be very difficult to look back and go, gosh, how did they do it in the old days? 
You know, it mm. really would have looked like you were flying blind, wouldn't it, as a result of that? So I think that's going to be fantastic. And I've put the title at the top of the page here, The Learning Culture. Uh, and again, I know that one of the big things that a lot of us are trying to engender is getting away from a conformant, you know, top-down view of life because you need that spontaneity for empowerment. And uh, getting people excited is all about helping them develop personally. So again, hugely important in terms of enabling the learning culture. So there's one topic, the people bit. Um, let's change our attention for a while and talk about customer. And again, a trending topic that we have seen in some of the research you have done with New Voice Media in the past, isn't mm -hmm. it? Where does customer effort fit in the metrics hierarchy? And it, it's gradually going up, isn't it? It is. It's, uh, it, we've moved uh, distinctly away from average handling time. Yeah. And certainly things that are, are much more customer focused, first contact resolution, uh, quality scores, customer effort are now really uh, center stage at, at the top. Again, it would be interesting, just casual for, for, for our audience today, how many are you formally measuring customer effort? It would be interesting to hear in the, in the chat room. But the, the quick answer to why you should be is it's one of those things that you get immediate benefit from because, frankly, customer effort is reflected in not getting stuff done quickly or right first time. So if you reverse that, you're spending less money in terms of cost to serve and customers are clearly more excited about you because you're not wasting their life. So it, it's got very short-term benefit to it and remains relevant for many, many... Actually, given what we all said early on, that most of us are dissatisfied with quality, this is a hugely important metric in that context. So having said all that, um, a bit of an old-fashioned 19... Sort of Windows 98 <laughs> <laughs> deployment of Excel, I'm afraid, but it's still relevant because it gives you the example of what you can see when you can get underneath the surface and start to figure out what we talked about in terms of failure demand. And this is really asking the big question, why are people calling? Can we reduce the reasons for people calling? Why do they need to waste their time doing their stuff? And you can't do that work until you can get underneath the thing. And here are examples like payment queries, progress checking. Why do people progress check in terms of allowing people to phone us in or not? That's a complete waste mm. of time. Why don't we proactively message, for example? And when you dig into your own situation, you're, you know, there are loads of things that you're getting the customers to do that really they should not be doing at the end of the day. So reducing the effort, getting the evidence for that. So. Again, you know, that's a whole program, by the way, that people can start to work up. Anyway, what's been happening whilst we've been talking uh, in the chat room? Have we got anybody yet nattering about effort? Um, we have, uh, Anna said, yes, we are measuring customer effort. We're consistently over 90%. Very good. So, um, presume that's 90% lower. Easy. Effort. So, uh, which is... Net easy, hopefully, yeah. yes. And lots of, uh, lots of questions coming through. So, let's just jump across to the... Uh, across to the chat room now and we can see uh, some of the, the questions that are coming up. So um, the first question we, uh, we have here is how can speech analytics improve quality assurance as a department? Can it, can it bring value? So Martin. Well, I think the first thing is, is um, to my first point, how are you currently doing it? And if you're doing it as most of us do it, you're having to tap in by listening to calls. So you have a problem with the amount of time that, that takes to get the calls. You have a problem with whether or not that's really teaching you anything. Um, and you've also got the problem of people accepting that it's a valid critique of their performance. A lot of people quite rightly say, you know, the one you chose is not the representative of what I've done in the month. Um, and I think that's just a very hard, long-winded way of doing it. So um, I would say, first and foremost, that analytics gives you much easier access to an infinitely richer <laughs> set of insight and therefore your job as assurance is transformed as a result. Mm -hmm. And if you don't believe me, uh, next time you network at any conference, try and find some people who are using analytics and say, well, look, how is it as a quality department? And it will just strike you as being, mm -hmm. you know, the difference between horse and cart versus train. You know, mm -hmm. it's just in a different dimension and league. So it's a massive transformation of your output. Yeah, and that, certainly that seems to be the, the most common use of speech analytics now is for, yeah. for quality purposes. Yeah. Um, comment in from Ollie saying, much as I'd like to deploy speech analytics, the organization won't invest in that. Yes. Um, that, I suppose, is getting easier now because the actual the costs of speech analytics, which 
a few years ago used to be sort of eye watering, are now becoming uh, becoming you know yeah. both cheaper and the business cases are becoming. Well, I uh, just say one thing, Ollie, on that point. The, the average you know ROI time wise, I always hear is under the year. You know, it's around about six to nine months. And interestingly, most most people who are providing this solution set are going to let you do POCs. Uh, and that still remains a, a very powerful, mu mutually useful way of doing it because A, you get to learn where your highest value opportunities sit in that uh, activity. And secondly, it gives the decision makers a chance to see what that kind of tool can do. Stasek, coming back to your slide where you said about the big data and how much is under the surface. Uh, if, you, if you run uh, your speech analytics on top of your contact center, there is the data. So uh, mm. it, it, if, if, if you talk to your vendor, you can usually get a POC that's based on the real yeah. data yes. from the past, because all this data is available in the contact center. So you, you might actually get numbers that are not uh, something in a PowerPoint. This would yeah. be real uh, hard data about past conversation and behaviors of your customers and how they were handled. Yeah. So, so, so and all, all it, it, it sounds bad, but at the moment, it's senior management and defining customer effort without really understanding the real okay. Impact. So, but potentially some call recordings might help with that. We've got an interesting comment that's come in from uh, Chanel, and that is: Would speech analytics have the capability of taking away human intervention completely? Uh, certainly, in terms of quality assessors and supervisors listening to calls. Uh, Arthur, have you got a, a take on that? So, uh, it will definitely not take away the human intervention completely because uh, speech analytics is based on machine learning uh, models and those models work well when they get uh, feedback and you have to teach them and people are changing as we said the interactions are changing people release new products so there's a lot of new things that you need to teach the model always so mm. usually uh, if you have a quality assurance uh, team that has 10 people you probably can reduce it to five because you don't need to scan the same amount of calls you can scan much less calls but you still need some amount of human interaction to provide the scoring uh, algorithm, the feedback, mm. if it's doing the right thing, so that it improves the scoring for everything else. So you, you know, it's, instead of scoring 5% and spending huge amounts of money on, on manual analytics there, yeah. you score 1%, but you have uh, good scores on 95% of your cost instead yeah. of you know, just having the 5%. So you will lower the cost, but you improve significantly uh, the outcome and accuracy of 99 or 95% of your uh, cortical. I think that's right. I mean, I think, I think with, particularly with machine learning, the, the common understanding these days is it's a balance, isn't it, of using human input and machine learning. Yes. So it's a new tool for humans to become more effective. We use language like humanizing work, you know, that sort of approach to life. Uh, and so I would say that it takes away the drudgery of what you'd be doing and allows you to focus upon where you'd like to get this stuff to, which is giving coaching, giving feedback, getting people more effective. Mm. So, it, it, you know, spades didn't replace people digging holes. It just no. helped you dig the hole better. Yeah, it certainly would help you find better, better recordings to uh, analyze. Question from Rachel, what's the most effective way of using repeat contact searches? So I guess Rachel's looking at first contact resolution or repeat contacts. What's the most effective way of using repeat contact searches to assess customer journeys. Ideally, you have to listen to each call to understand the experience. Is there a way to expedite the, that overall experience? Um, so I'm just going to feed back to see if I understand. Oh, so repeat contact, meaning that we didn't do first time resolution is what yeah. we're hearing. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the caller may oh, say something that? like, I'm calling again, right. or right. your CRM shows that there may be a match of that. So, so Obviously, if you can get an accurate way of defining that problem, you're looking for anything that is giving more effort from the customer's point of view and mm -hmm. taking us longer. Um, and do you have to listen to each call to understand that? Well, coming back to another point, at least the way I've been brought up to see it and, and think about it, is that I think the machine, you know, speech analytics does the heavy lifting. You still have to have the intelligence to think about what we should focus upon and create the hypothesis. So I think it like a detective, all right? You still have to solve that problem. Mm. So in other words, in coming back to this answer, you would probably say, uh, what journeys, well, let's start. Everyone's upset, low score at the end of mm -hmm. billing, right? 
let's go and listen to some billing things. Let's go and find some of the key topics that we can hear there. Now, I think it's there for a story because it's unexpected the amount. It's mm. difficult to understand. It's late in delivery. All those kind of key things. What I'd now do is go down and sample individual calls mm. to see whether or not that's the case. Yeah. I refine my understanding. I might change the search from that and go, ask me this, and suddenly go, bingo. I've now got a much better understanding of that thing. Mm. How many times is that happening is my next question. Gosh, that's an expensive problem. So I think it's like being a detective. You're working in collaboration with the system to help you spec out the problem. Mm. I guess there's, there's sort of three ways of finding repeat contact. One is have people called back within a time period, but yeah. they may call back for a different reason. Yeah. The other one is, is it a repeat call that's put in the CRM system? Yeah. Or is there some way of listening to the call to say, I called you last week, I've already called you, or I spoke to you? And th this is where actually speech analytics helps a lot because probably you will have the record of all the contacts. You may run a query against some database, your CRM, your contact center, where have there been you know, repeat contacts from the same customer. But with the data from speech analytics, you might be able to identify which of those were about the same topic. And then yes. this pinpoints you to a smaller subset of calls that you should listen to. And there's one more thing that I would like to address. I, I hear people asking about listening to calls, mm. but with speech analytics, actually the act of listening to a call can be uh, significantly reduced as well, because people can read much faster than you listen. Sure. And with speech analytics, where you have certain phrases, sentences, or um, elements of the uh, conversation mm. highlighted and presented to your text, you probably can accelerate by a factor of three or four yeah. the time Required to analyze a call by so a human being. So again, as well as the yes. Yes. So I, I, I trust yeah. including the highlights yeah. of you know significant yeah. phrases. So you you can go to the moment of the of the speech which which has been critical. You can kind of listen only to this piece. However, I think there's pros and cons because the other thing you're missing there is tone of voice. No, good speech analytics was actually highlighted as well. No, but you you uh, hear tone of voice yeah. rather than read yeah. it. So again, I would say both are useful because if you're still looking, I agree, you read it faster than you can hear it. So I think that's a real advantage. I'd like to have both available. To oh, the, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, the yeah but then you are in, in somewhere in the transcript and you call you now and I want to listen. How to that voice particular piece. Yes, the call is 10 minutes. You probably need to listen oh, to no, no, right, exactly. that. Or it's bookmarked at the right point. Exactly. exactly. We've got yeah, yeah. time for... It makes it much faster. Sorry, no, John's just going to get us to... We've back got back. a couple of uh, couple of other comments. Ben has uh, said we are starting to use speech analytics to identify, identify calls that need evaluation based on keywords being said yeah. or not being said, okay. which I think is the, the question we had about the uh, quality yeah. process. Uh, we've got a question from Lucy saying, how would speech analytics work where the calls are not scripted? Uh, our agents yeah. have to follow a call structure, but are allowed to word the calls in their in their own way. So Thank goodness for that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's a great, great example. So, so compliance was only the one, for instance, uh, Lucy. You know, and and you don't have to do compliance by all saying in the same way, but most people tend to. The real value of analytics is is, is way more than that. Its ability to pick up on anything that's been said by an advisor and or by a customer in any particular way. So think of it much more broadly as being something that allows you to uh, not just go for keywords, that's a certain level of confidence, but really understand a topic. You know, understand really whether or not the topic's been understood by the advisor, whether or not we have solved that topic what the problems have been en route to getting that done. If there's a certain kind of expectation within the journey that isn't being met, there's a much richer set of things mm. that with, uh, you know, you need to build your capability on this, but you can start to understand. That's why it's a much more uh, powerful tool. So yes, the answer is it will teach you much, much more, uh, particularly in unstructured discussion. Yeah. And here's a question for Arthur. Um, what about the quality of the call recordings you, you've got? You know, should it, uh, should it take care of it? Does it influence the performance of analytics? Because if you know people are calling in from a mobile phone, yes. or you've got a very noisy contact and with lots of background noise. Yes, the, the quality of call recording is extremely important, and uh, yeah, it needs to be a stereo call recording so you can recognize who's talking. And then uh, we even you know we uh, we have changed our standard. Uh, compression algorithm for, for, for the call recordings for our speech analytics product because 
to make it clearer. Uh, yeah, to make it clearer because yeah. uh, a lot of the, the nuance in the voice is being lost, specifically yeah. with uh, with uh, with the mobile phones. Uh, so the LTE, the new new technologies will improve it, but mm -hmm. on on the older GSM standard, uh, a lot of the nuance of of uh, how how the yeah. tone of the voice was yeah. is, is going lost. So the yeah. transcript may be okay, but uh, but you're losing losing a lot of time. Yeah. yeah. Indeed, so some fa fascinating. We're going to come back to some yeah. questions. Great there. questions. Martin, you've got some other examples of where speech analytics can be, uh, yeah. Yeah. Can be used if you'd like to uh, yeah. share yeah. some of those. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do. Oh. Right. Oh, it is a nice one. Uh, this is uh, the name of the organization wasn't provided, so it's just a financial services business. But again, something that probably a lot of us can anticipate or relate to, I should say. The customer. Um, has unfortunately paid the bill twice. It's not nice paying it once, but twice over is terrible. <laughs> and so what they want to do is contact the company for reimbursement. However, the process of reclaiming was a very, very frustrating one. Yeah, I mean, it really upset them. And so clearly it's just a no-win for either side if that's happening. They could identify the amount of times that was happening. It became something they wanted to get fixed. And so they just moved into proactive mode uh, they used both an online and also a telephony channel to proactively tell customers they'd already paid before they were about to make that mistake. And guess what? Everybody got happy and spent less money. So I think that's a lovely example of reducing effort by being proactive. Uh, here is another interesting one. You know, the insurer found that the repeat calls, and this is a key thing, actually somebody asked the question, do we know why customers keep calling us? And what they had discovered was it related to claims billing questions and inquiries. So again, claims is a very, very important journey, often frustrating. We're hoping for a great outcome. Businesses can sometimes spend a long time getting to the point of making a decision on a claim. Uh, and interestingly, quite a few companies these days, fintech companies, are just about getting claims done instantly. You know what I mean? It's one of those hot topic areas. Anyway. Get it wrong, you can cause a lot of people to phone you in and keep pestering you. So as a result, uh, we changed the process, improved the training, understand calls by the way that do and don't want a transfer. Everybody, again, gets happier as a result. So closely related, you might want to think of it like this, though. Customer experience management. Um, again, how can analytics help? And this is really for those of you in the audience that have embarked upon journeys. You know, um, topic I'm talking a lot about at the moment when I ask people to put their hands up, you know, it's anything from maybe 10, sometimes actually up to 50, 60 percent of the room have either got journeys being mapped at corporate level, some of us have got journeys being mapped within the contact center level. In other words, we are looking particularly about where we sit in those journeys. And I would say that speech analytics is absolutely a key input to understanding current journeys and also helping to recognize what customers are asking for in terms of future state journeys. Um, here's a sort of version of it, I suppose. This is a, a US-based uh, outsource business, the results company. And they do something that I think a number of us do these days, which is that when we get feedback from a post-interaction survey, all the low-scoring ones are ind individually followed up and resolved. That's good practice. However, they also go back to that data and do root cause on it, understand it, solve it, and then track it uh, over time. And the ability to track over time is what the speech analytics tool can do. So again, that's incredibly important. It's difficult to know if we've solved stuff. You know, it's very difficult to hear if that problem's actually been taken out of the queue. It's pretty simple building a query and then have it run all the time to say, have we succeeded? Have we not succeeded? And that applies for anything you're trying to fix. An individual advisor's performance level, uh, an issue the customer you know, has, um, the increase or decrease of a call disposition. The, mm -hmm. the idea of being able to run a trend, automate that, and get benefit from that is one of the key benefits that uh, analytics gives you at a strategic level. This is one of the slides that I have shared before, but it's such a cracking slide, I don't feel that guilty today uh, about reintroducing it because it's a story of saying that in terms of how customers rate us, which is in this context NPS, the range from plus 50 to minus 95 comes from two main things. One on the left-hand side 
did we solve it, did we not, which is the resolve, not resolve left-hand column. But then the third column in is all to do with behaviorally how the customer experienced the way we delivered that service. And what's fascinating about that slide for me is just on the top level, I might have fixed it for you, but the way I did it gives me a spread of score from plus 50 to minus 45. Hmm. That's huge. That's huge. And if NPS matters to you, the devil is in the detail there. Mm -hmm. So what is, that, what is going on? And again, analytics, fantastic as understanding the two things that will drive NPS. The functional aspect, it was so hard getting stuff done, and then the emotional, how did we connect, you know, mm -hmm. were you appropriate, and all the rest of that stuff. And again, you can dig in and really get clear about NPS management. The other interesting area I'm talking about a lot, and I can just see this happening more and more and more, is of course the ability to translate a feeling into a set of words and phrases. And I don't know anybody quite yet coming out of the box saying the following phrases are all the same as sad, and the following phrases are all about happy. But you could certainly, whilst you're waiting for that vendor to turn up, build your own, you know, through a series of queries and mm -hmm. saying what are the words that our customers give that are indicative of being upset with us, mm -hmm. that are indicative of being pleased with us, and then run those queries, and you have the basis of an emotion management, you know, which again is becoming increasingly important. Um, churn, if you want a nice, strong ROI, here's your, here's your use case. Um, we still lose far too many customers over time, it's a silly thing. And here's just something very, very obvious, but it's a nice to see it in, 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 in the real world. You look at statements that the customer gives you that says they are on the verge of leaving. All right? So look at statement, compare fees, this is ridiculous. And to your point, Arthur, it's very powerful if you have the ability to connect that to CRM, because you might begin with a subset of customers that you know have left the business. And so if you know they've left the business, you go back, listen to the recordings, and this is where you can go, ah, they were telling us actually, they were upset. Mm -hmm. And then going forward, you've got a predictive model there sitting, as soon as people start to use that language, we know there's a high likelihood they're about to go. And then of course, you intervene and whatever. And in this particular case, they save four and a half thousand accounts in a year, and they save you know, that amount of money as a result of it. So that's one version of churn management. Another one that I'm also aware of is where you combine interaction history with transaction history. Uh, and what's basically happening there is you've got a more accurate way, again, of predicting churn. And it's no surprise to say that people talking to you about their experience is a very good indicator. But again, a lot of predictive models are not using interaction analytics because it's not been available. So an insurance business has done this for years, but they've done it purely on the transactional data level. Mm -hmm. So you put those two together, massive impact. And it raises the uh, accuracy of the predictive model by about 25 to 30%. And given the fact that you're always gonna have a limited amount of resource and budget to go chase people, yeah, guessing which are the ones that are gonna go, getting a more accurate model is hugely mm -hmm. important. So good, strong uh, commercial case there. I think the last area we're going to quickly look at is just the whole business of if you get your mojo going on all of this, then clearly you're starting to be able to, with authority and evidence, feed back to different parts of the organization opportunities for improvement. Actually, I should start somewhere else. How many of the problems our customers have are caused by us in the call center versus them in other departments? <laughs> this is always a, a, a great part of the conversation because we all like to go, yeah, it's not <laughs> us, it's them. And it's true. And I don't find people typically in the call center think that they are to blame in that sense or accountable for that more than 5 10%. So it stands to reason that the rest of the business is causing the inbound. Now, mostly we've been stuck in a loop that says, you can't evidence that, we're not going to change the way we work, thank you very much, go away. Mm. And that's been the standoff that we've had for 25 years. You know? Yeah. This allows you to evidence it. So you have to do it with some subtlety. You have to build up that capability. But that's the big, big opportunity sitting there. Uh, so to that end, and this is a super idea. It's blindingly obvious, but I've never seen this before. One credit card company forwards one single service call every day to 1,500 employees, which I think is a, is, a, is a mailing list that they subscribe to, that they can individually hear about the issues and pain points driving customers. And the goal is to have as many people hear the call to raise awareness 
about how everyone actually does impact the customer experience. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's just such a sensible thing. So as a byproduct of doing the analytics on a daily basis, you might find a call that is illustrative of doing some great stuff, some poor things, something that we need to bring attention to. And so you use that one single call, distribute it out to the business, let mm -hmm. people raise their own awareness on that point. I thought that was a great thing. That's that one. Uh, then to the point that I just actually made, the difference between winning the argument you know, if you don't have the facts, it can easily descend into an us and them situation. But it's very powerful if your use case says, these are the number of times that this problem has occurred over this period of time. The cost of fixing it has been that, the bill is this, the trend still continues, what are we going to do? That puts you in a very strong position to get stuff fixed. Most executives will sponsor you if you've got the evidence in that sort of way. Hence, you can create change. Um, and so speech analytics make the issues visible, the number of times, the cost, the examples, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then you are able to really drive the ROI of speech analytics and the ROI of customer service. So as a sort of a whole slide release to finish off our hard section, analytics, you can develop your focus on a whole number of obvious things like, you know, why people are talking to you, the cause, the volume, the duration, the type the ability to resolve the experience of the customer as a result. And that tells you an incredibly broad set of things around us. Engine, you know, so enterprise process and workflow, the product the service set, the skills, the know-how gaps, the culture, the strategy, the information, the policies, the whole damn kit and caboodle. And that will take you time to build that feedback loop and develop that into collaborative learning, let's be effective culture. Uh, but nonetheless, the net results and the clues in the headline, you are able to move your business from being considered a cost center to being considered a hub in the rest of the business. And that, at the end of the day, is why I'm a bit of a fan of analytics, because it allows us to get, I think, into a better place with regard to the value that we could and should be delivering to the rest of the business. So, Arthur, do you want your... No, I, 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 I completely agree with you, and I, I think that, you know, both analyzing the, the historical data and comparing this on, let's say, not real time, but like what are the trends in my business, uh, give you very, very powerful tool, tool, tool also to impact how the organization as a whole is, is functioning. Because yeah. uh, you know what your customers are calling you about. You can see that there are some emerging trends and you can uh, react much faster. Yeah. If yeah. you have the data at your fingertips uh, connected to your strategic data in the CRM, so in this uh, enormous uh, vault of data and gold nuggets that, that uh, speech analysis. And there's nowhere else you up. can get it from. You can't get it in a retail face to face. You can't get it online in the same way. It's, it's incredibly valuable. Isn't it? Yes, yes. And yeah. not, in, not only in the service, I mean, this, the same functionality is also extremely powerful for you know, outbound and sales mm. related mm. activities. Yeah. Uh, where you have very good re results of you know, who's a good agent yeah. calling out because yeah. you know, there's a sales and usually it's very well attributed to someone. So kind of being able to compare which behaviors drive the better outcomes and then using mm -hmm. this for the learning uh, experience of, of, of you know, how to train others to yeah. be like uh, the most successful people, this is uh, enormous value for, mm -hmm. for most of the organizations. So happy times for the 58% of you who are going to invest. <laughs> yes. Exciting things. Yeah. And then the last thing, sorry, I, I have got one more slide up, my apologies. Just to say very quickly that it also fits into another key theme, I think, which is to get advisors much more involved in setting the pace, setting the culture, setting the improvement, and being really part of the improvement culture. And again, I would be tempted to say they are very good at hypothesizing what might want to be further investigated. So I would use daily meetings and team briefings, those kinds of things to say, anybody hear stuff? Anybody think it's a good thing? Yeah, I believe that. We'll send that then to the analytics team and see if there's any evidence that that's more widespread. Sometimes it will be, sometimes it won't. But if it has been, then again, we do the full number on it. We get it out. We make transformations. And I'd like to suggest, number four, we reward those people that have actually kicked off that whole chain of events. And then suddenly, people in the contact center can have an incredible impact on the rest of their organization. That's what makes it a real fun place to be. 
Excellent. Well, we're going to jump across to a poll now, and the poll uh, is what would what are your priorities for speech analytics? So do you think it will be for quality and performance? Is it for cost to serve, reducing the overall cost? Is it for customer experience? Is it for uh, spotting customer dissatisfaction? Or is it for innovation? So if you'd just like to uh, both, uh, vote on which of those you think is uh, uh, closest to what you're looking for, and uh, we'll have a look at the uh, uh, results here. Put those up on the screen. So we have uh, the most common one seems to be quality yes. uh, and performance, uh, followed by customer experience is a uh, uh, comes next, followed by spotting customer dissatisfaction, uh, yeah. accounts for about 55% of the audience. 20% uh, is innovation, and only 10% is about reducing the cost to serve. Interesting. Interesting. So um, some quite uh, yeah. quite fascinating uh, results there. Uh, we're going to jump across and have a look at some of the uh, some of the questions. And the first one, I think, for you, Arthur, uh, how well does speech analytics recognise regional dialects within yeah. the uh, within the within the UK? Can it can it re uh, detect someone from Glasgow? Uh, it's it's actually getting better, but I must say that you know, UK is not. Uh, we, we had the discussion before the webinar where UK is a very special market where there's not only the regional dialects, but there's a lot of people that you know, came to the country that would speak with American accent, Polish accent, South African accent, uh, and then plus the whole variety of the British accent. So actually, uh, there are very good models for the you know, UK English, but in UK you have so many other dialects that uh, um, this is actually the, the most difficult market I, I see for, for speech analytics. Mm -hmm. It's actually for not speech analytics, it's more for the transcription that you apply later on the yeah. text to analyze it. I guess the one big advantage though, because it's not happening in real time, if you know there's one that's slightly wrong, you can see the transcript, listen to the record, and then just move on to the next one on the on the list. So yes, there yes. Is and, and, then, and then actually speech analytics usually provides you also the quality score, you know, so, so you uh, you can with a good good confidence tell which of the speech analytics uh, Analyze calls. We have a high confidence in which not, not. Mm. So, so you're not kind of doing bad decisions. Yes. You can you can say, well, okay, I have only 80% of calls analyzed properly, but at least I know this is like 95% confident that, that those are analyzed well. So, so this is not a, not such a bad situation here. And Charlie's asked the question: Can you use speech analytics to measure emotions? And this is often a big debate. There's a sort of between sentiment and emotion. What, what's your, your view on that? So uh, we are doing research on it. So there are tools now. We analyze also emotions. I can tell you the results yet, but this is the next thing to come. Uh, and and that's, that's where a lot of the things around quality management, so this is based really on text analytics, where you, know, you do the transcription of the speech to text, and then this is being analyzed using keyword searches, machine learning, uh, natural language processing engines. Emotions really require the, you know, that's where the quality of the collector comes in because uh, you, you apply the same technologies as voice biometric uh, companies are applying. This is already quite an uh, advanced area where tools exist that they were used for something else, but the same technologies that are used for voice biometrics, which is quite mature. well mature today, are being now applied also to kind of discover the emotions and, and it's actually you get more out of the tone of people's voice than from the words themselves. So, so I, I, I think that this will, it's not, it's not mainstream yet, but it will, uh, it, it's, it's, it's uh, coming. Yeah, indeed. Um, and there's been a lot of questions in the chat room. Here's one from Cindy, just about how you get the return on investment or the business case for speech analytics. Um, so Cindy says, I perceive that speech analytics will ultimately pay for itself. Yeah. Uh, the question seems to be: With so many bits of the of the, the part of the company oh, yes. benefiting, who should be who yes. should be paying? So, uh, I, I think put another way around, your first problem once you've got it through the front door and it's on, is you'll have a rush of people suddenly demanding that they must be first in the queue, um, and the prioritisation of it is often one of the things that is first built. <laughs> 
and then some of your problems are that you don't get around to problems for a year. I know a company, for example, that is doing it right now. They have a list right, of things to go and figure out. It's 18 months long already. And the queue, the, you know, how long you've got to wait before you can put a question. So they're clearly not quite doing it right. Um, I think that eventually, this is my point, analytics changes the organization, the contact center, to becoming a central hub where everybody benefits. So in that scenario, at some point in that journey, mm -hmm. you've got a number of ways to do it. You could either charge for that service internally, or you could next year uh, say, should we all fund it? And, I, think, and, and I, I do think that all front-end organizations, sales, marketing, and service, would and do get benefit mm -hmm. from it. So you start there. And uh, so the fact that it would, or you could be a very adventurous organization and say, we will buy it yeah. and we will use it in order to become more powerful in our own organization. You could take that view on that. I think it's very nicely summarized here by Cindy. Cindy says, marketing sells and operation delivers. If marketing doesn't work with operations when they sell, there can be significant issues. And I think one of the advantages of speech analytics yeah. enables you to have a more structured conversation with the yes. rest of the uh, rest of the departments. Unfortunately, we're timed out. That's all we've got. Uh, all we've got time for. Top of the hour. Uh, just like to say in one or two words, what did you like best uh, about today's webinar? We'll be picking the winning tip uh, immediately after the webinar and putting that out onto uh, or audience question, putting that out. Uh, if you could complete the survey as you leave our webinar, uh, the survey will come up. Uh, you can watch the re replay later on today, callcenterhelper.com forward slash recorded webinar. And I'd just like to thank our two speakers, Martin Hill Wilson from Brain Food Consultants. Pleasure, thank you. And to uh, Arthur uh, Mikalczyk uh, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll be joining you uh, next week where we're going to be looking at uh, quality monitoring. Thank you then. Bye-bye.